Bueno, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Desde a Washington DC les habla Alejandro de la Puente. Eh, hoy tenemos un muy eh, increíble seminario, webinario, eh, de un colega, Javier Bertou, que está en, la, en el Centro Atómico de Bariloche y trabaja para, eh, bueno, es el, el coordinador internacional de los, eh, el proyecto Andes, eh, que mide eh, eh, rayos cósmicos y también es miembro del Pierre Auger, eh, de la colaboración Pierre Auger. Eh, Javier, eh, estoy streaming. Ah. Yes. Can you speak in English, please? Oh, sorry. Shoot. Ah, that's crazy. <laughs> that's a good thing. Now I'm thinking in Spanish. Okay, sorry about that, guys. So, uh, okay, for those who understood Spanish, that's great. Uh, my name is Alejandro La Puente, and I'm going to introduce you to our speaker of today, uh, Javier Berto. He's uh, with with the uh, Centro Atomico de Bariloche and works for the Andes Collaboration and is a member of the Pierre Auger Collaboration as well. Uh, he obtained his PhD at the University of Paris. And uh, today he's going to tell us about the Andes Underground uh, Laboratory in Latin America. Um, so with that, uh, after his talk, uh, we're going to open the, uh, the, the floor for questions. And you can always ask your questions if you're watching this uh, live through the question and answer panel on the right hand side of, of your screen. Uh, okay, thank you so much, uh, Javier, for, for your time, and, and we really appreciate you doing this for the Latin American webinars. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to share my screen to see if you can get the slides. Uh -huh. Does it work? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to to tell you about uh, the, this this project we we have of uh, having an underground laboratory in, in Latin America, the Andes project. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'd like to start with a disclaimer. As Alejandro said, I'm a cosmic ray astrophysicist. I've been working in cosmic rays for all my career, so more than 20 years now. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the place where we go when we don't want to see cosmic rays. So even if it's been a few years now, uh, I'm still not a, a total expert on, on some of the topics I'm going to talk about. And also, uh, it's kind of a politics talk. I mean, I'm going to, to talk about uh, a facility. Uh, so it's not uh, the usual physics talk. Well, of course, I will talk about physics, but not only about physics. So uh, these are the two disclaimers for, for, for this talk. Uh, so, uh, why uh, going underground when you can have the beautiful views of all those pictures you, you can see in this slide? Well, basically, it is to get rid of, of radiation, right? So, when, when you, go, you go underground to, to, to get rid of this cosmic rays, and just to, to put a few numbers, uh, if you consider a cubic square, uh, a square a cubic meter detector, uh, typically from, from cosmic ray secondary, you, you get uh, about 10 to the 8. Uh, muons, uh, gammas, uh, electrons and positrons, and about 10 to the 6 neutron every day in, in your detector. And so if you want to, to see neutrinos or, or to look, uh, search for dark matter, then you, uh, you, you have this huge background you, you need to, uh, to get rid of. So the signal-to-noise ratio is really awful. Uh, the reason you have this bad uh, signal to noise ratio is not that that you don't have neutrino or dark matter. There are actually a lot of them, but uh, they are weakly interacting only. Uh, at least we hope for, for dark matter. Uh, so basically, the, the question is not a question of flux, but it's a question of interaction. So if you go, if you if you put some some material on top of your detector to protect from cosmic rays, then you you can get rid of, of these muons, and gammas, and neutrons, and and go to to the physics you're interested in, so neutrinos and, and dark matter. And since you have to to add a quite a quite a lot of uh, of lead of, or whatever you, you use to to protect your detector, usually the only uh, the only way to really do it is to go underground and uh, and and use nature to to, to protect your detectors. So if, if you consider the muon, which is from, let's say, the, the, the usual uh, cosmic background, uh, cosmic ray background, uh, the, the most penetrating particles are the, the one you want to protect mainly from, uh, you, you have to, to go from a, a few hundred uh, of these muons per square meter per second to, to rate which have to, to be much lower. And so here you, you have a graph where you can see the variation of the muon uh, flux uh, as a function of the depth. So the depth is usually, in, when, when we talk about underground, 
laboratories, we, we use uh, meters of water equivalent. Uh, to, typically, a rock is 2.5 or 2.7 uh, meters of, of water per meter of rock. And so here you see then a, a few laboratories uh, with their names uh, and how the, the flux goes down. And so typically, uh, equivalent of 5,000 meters, you, you get a rate of muon of about one per square meter per day. So compared to 100 per square meter per second, you, you see this is a, a, a huge uh, reduction in, in, the cosmic, uh, in the cosmic background. And so this opens you uh, a window to, to do a lot of experiments that would not be possible uh, in, a, in a normal uh, laboratory. So what, what do you do when you go underground? Well, uh, this is a very active field. And uh, so I have this uh, funny slide uh, <coughs> with uh, some titles of, uh, of presentation of one conference, uh, the TOPE uh, conference, uh, quite a few years ago, actually. It's, I think it's five years ago. And, and so these are only underground experiments. So there, there is really a, a lot of uh, things going on underground. And, and basically, the, the three main, main topics are on neutrino, dark matter, and, and, and let's say low background measurement. So I'm not going to, to enter in, in details in these things. I mean, it, it would be very long. Uh, so, so I'm just, just giving some, some words and some hints of these things. Of course, we, we can talk about that in, in the questions uh, after, after the presentation. But basically, so Neutrino is one of the, of the main uh, experiments uh, running in underground. Uh, quite a few uh, Nobel Prizes were, were won uh, on this topic, and the last one in, uh, three years ago, uh, <coughs> uh, from for Kajita and, and McDonald. Uh, so you have different sources of neutrinos that you can uh, you can detect underground. They can come from nuclear reactor. Uh, they can come from particle accelerators. So nuclear reactor, for example, uh, Kamlan in in Kamiokan in Japan. Uh, from particle accelerator, for example, Opera or Dune, uh, where you you produce them in. <coughs> In, at CERN or, or at Fermilab, and you detect them uh, hundreds of kilometers away uh, in a detector underground. It can be atmospheric neutrinos. So atmospheric means uh, they are produced in, in the reactor, interaction of cosmic rays in the atmosphere. Uh, solar neutrinos are produced in, in the sun. Uh, astrophysical neutrinos, well, solar are astrophysical, but let's say uh, further away uh, from, than the sun, for example, supernova neutrinos. Uh, or even geoneutrinos, which are neutrinos produced in, in the Earth in, in, in the radioactive decays of uranium, thorium, and, and potassium that is in the rock in, in the Earth. And actually, it's believed that about half of the thermal balance of, of the Earth is, is due to the heating of, of these uh, nuclear decays. So, so it's uh, also an, an important field. And so depending on which of these neutrinos you, you observe, then the the range of physics is also very, very wide. And so you, you can look uh, to, to understand neutrino oscillation, try to, to understand and to measure the masses of neutrinos, or at least the differences of, of masses. Nature of the neutrino itself, this is a, a Majorana or, or Dirac particle. Or you, you, or you can go to, to, to the astrophysics and uh, try to understand uh, better the, the sun, the reactions which occur in the sun, the metallicity, or, of the sun or the stars, you can try to understand how a supernova explodes and what's what's happening. You can even look for the uh, CMB uh, neutrinos or neutrinos from <coughs> from the early ages of, of the universe. Or you, you can do geophysics, as, as I said, with the geoneutrinos and understand the thermal balance of the Earth, maybe uh, understand some uh, movement, uh, uh, well, geophysics, basically. So, so it, it's really a a wide area of research based on only one particle, this neutrino, which which you can you can study from from underground. And then a, a second uh, quite wide topic also is what is called multidisciplinary underground experiments. So <clears throat> basically, anything which is not neutrino or dark matter enters in in, in this field, and so so. I've put again geoneutrinos for geoscience, but uh, also you can do things which are not high energy physics or which are not particle physics uh, with uh, low frequency seismographs and, and, and other stuff. You, you can do also biology or low radiation measurements. 
which allows you to do some, let's say, material physics or climatology, even uh, some studies are about, about wine. So it, it's, it's a topic which is not really related to what our field, let's say, high energy physics is usually in, but it's, it's quite interesting. So I've just put, for example, I, I'm not going to, to talk much about them, uh, but well, it's this kind of thing we, we don't see in our field, so it, it's funny to, to talk about it just in a, a few minutes. Uh, so one study is about uh, heavy metals in plants. So there are some plants which are probably able to, to, to clean the soil by, uh, by taking, for example, lead out of the soil and, and processing it. So the question is, how do they do that? And it's not easy to measure. So normally what, what you have to do is you, you plant these things and then at some point you, you get some of them, you cut them, you analyze them in a lab. So if you go underground, then the, <clears throat> the amount of background radiation is so low, then you could measure uh, how the, the lead go through the plant by using some, some uh, using radioactive lead. And so you, you could measure in real time how, how this lead is going through, through the plant. Uh, another study uh, has to do with uh, <clears throat> with biology, which is this cosmic radiation impact on cells. Uh, so we all know that when you increase the radiation, you, you, you deal damage to, to, to the cells. But what is, is funny, it looks like that there is a need for a minimum amount of radiation uh, for, the, for the cells to, to train on how to, to repair DNA damage. And it's been checked that cells which are grown in underground laboratory with, with no background radiation are actually uh, less, uh, are more sensitive to damage than cells which are grown uh, outside since it looks like they, they don't have the mechanism to repair when, when, they, when, they, get, uh, when they get damaged. So this is one, one kind of study also you, you can do in, in underground laboratories. And there are some, uh, for example, a study is a population of sardine and, and anchovy uh, in Peru, uh, which is very important for uh, <coughs> economic reasons for uh, and uh, the statistics you have on, on this population is just a few uh, tens of years. And if you go to, to, to low, low background radiation measurements, uh, uh, taking some sediments in, in, uh, from the coast, you, you can get uh, evolution in, in the last few hundred years and uh, look at the impact of temperature of the water on, on these things and maybe make extrapolation of what can happen with global warming. So it's some studies you, you would not expect to, to, to be done in underground laboratories. You can look at lead contamination uh, on, on time scale of a few years, uh, while normally you cannot do that with, them, with resolution of more than tens of years in, in, in surface laboratory due to cosmic background. You can look at, <coughs> at beta error rate in chips. IBM is doing this kind of, of studies in underground laboratories. And you can even look at the cesium in, in wine uh, to be able to detect fraud of wines which are supposed to be 100 years old, but in fact are just a, a few tens of, uh, of years old. So, so it's, a, it's a wide area also of studies that, is that you do in, in these underground laboratories, which have nothing to do with our community of high energy physics. Except that sometimes some of, well, a lot of these measurements are done with uh, our detectors, let's say germanium detectors, and, and kind of techniques that we have developed in, in particle physics. Oops. Uh, <clears throat> then the, well, one of the most uh, exciting uh, topics to, to do in, in these underground laboratories is, is looking for dark matter, so the dark side of the universe. Uh, so there is this quote that a friend of mine uses in his talk, and I. I always like to use it because, I mean, uh, citing uh, Donald Rumsfeld in, in the physics talk you know, is not so often. Uh, there are no knowns, the things we know we know, there are also known unknowns. And there are also unknowns and unknowns, he says. So dark matter is this kind of known unknowns. So, so we know, we are almost sure there is dark matter, but we really don't know what it is. Uh, so since I'm a mathematician, uh, I have a mathematician formation, I have to say to Donald that there are also the unknown knowns, so the, the, the things uh, uh, we know, but we don't even uh, realize that we know, but uh, <clears throat> that's um, just uh, uh, for the story. So these known unknowns, uh, dark matter, so this is a pie uh, cut of uh, the amount of dark matter in the universe. Uh, so it's an old one now, it's 24%. Uh, and, uh, we have less dark energy on 69. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> so basically, in 85% of the matter in, in the universe is it, supposed to be this, this dark matter, and we have no clue of, uh, of what it is. Uh, we've seen it in, in many, uh, many different observations from the CMB, uh, nuclear synthesis. I mean, there are a lot of uh, different studies, uh, rotation of galaxies in different scales, and, and they are all coherent with this vision that 85% uh, of the matter in the universe is, is from a non-bionic uh, matter that we, we really don't know what, what it is. And there is this, uh, this uh, famous bullet cluster uh, where you see uh, two, two galaxies which, are, which have come and, and hit one another, and you see the gas which is heated in, in, in between. But when you look at where the gravity is, the gravity is moved away from, from where you have the gas. So it's also a, a good indication, uh, a good interpretation for, for these things is, is to believe that uh, the 85% of the, of the matter in this galaxy was uh, dark matter. And so it, you know, during in, in, in the collision, dark matter did not interact much uh, one with another and so moves away and goes uh, uh, in, in its normal uh, direction while the matter interacts and, and stays, stays behind. So that's why you, you see uh, light, uh, not where the matter is. So, so basically, everybody seems to, well, most people agree that that we have dark matter. Now the question is, can we detect it in in an underground laboratory? And and it's not it's not easy, but that's what we, what we try to do. Uh, so here is a uh, well, it's already a two years old uh, graph of the limit. Now uh, xenon is is a, is a bit lower than Panala and, and Lux. Uh, so basically, what you do when you, you want to look for that dark matter, you put a, a detector, uh, ideally a big detector, or at least a, a precise detector. It's usually difficult to, to get both big and precise. So you see there are here Crest and CDMS light, which are kind of uh, light detectors, but precise detectors. And then Panaekis, Lux, and Xenon, which are big detectors, but less precise detectors. And so uh, you, you try to, to see an interaction uh, by uh, which would be a, a dark matter particle getting into into your detector through the thousands of meters of rock, which uh, uh, which protect your, your detector and produce some some signal that 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 you would uh, associate to to this dark matter particle. Usually, it's a nuclear recall, and, and you try to discriminate that from all the possible background sources you have, and most of them are not nuclear recall. And so in the end, you, you don't see anything usually. And so you, you put a limit uh, to, <coughs> to, the, to the possible uh, parameters of dark matter, which are basically uh, cross-section. So uh, how much does this uh, dark matter interact with, uh, with our normal matter? And uh, what is the mass of this dark matter particle? And so if it's uh, heavy enough to, to interact on, on xenon, which are these experiments, uh, since they are very big, you can put a, a very stringent limit. Uh, but if it's not uh, heavy enough to, to produce a significant signal in signal in xenon, then you have to go to, to other material, uh, typically uh, <coughs> silicium or, or germanium. And, and so usually the detectors are much smaller, so the limits are not as uh, strong a, as in xenon. But you can go to a, to a range of mass for the dark matter uh, candidate, which which go to to, to lower lower values. Now, uh, it's a very important topic, su such as it, it went to the Big Bang Theory. And there is one in particular which uh, I like, which is this one, uh, a very old one, season two, uh, where Leonard and his mother talk about uh, replicating uh, the dark matter signal found in uh, sodium iodide crystal by the Italians. So that's the Dama Libra experiment in, in Gran Sasso which sees a, a modulation in, in the signal uh, and a modulation which is compatible with a signal coming from dark matter due to the uh, modulation you expect from the mod movement of the, of the Earth uh, around uh, the sun and the sun uh, in the galaxy, uh, giving you a, a wind of dark matter. And, and the funny thing of this story is that uh, the mother say, says to, to Leona that it's, it doesn't seem interesting to replicate uh, an experiment. Uh, actually, uh, it is something which is uh, done a lot in, in the community because it's one of the very few experiments which has a potential signal. But the issue with this, with this signal is that uh, it could be uh, mimicked 
by, uh, for example, atmospheric effect. Uh, so basically, you have an excess of count in, in June and a deficit of count in December, which could be due, for example, to, to, to change in, in the temperature in the high atmosphere and so changing the muon flux, even if there is about a month of difference in these things. So one of the things you could do, one of the things Leonard could have answered to his mother is, well, I'm going to, to do it, but in the southern hemisphere. So in this case, uh, the, the atmospheric effect would be the opposite one, while the dark matter the modulation would be the, the same one. Problem is, as there is no uh, laboratory in the southern hemisphere. So here you see a, a map of underground laboratories, and this is what uh, allows me to, to introduce uh, Andes. And you see that all the laboratories are in, in the northern hemisphere, in the US, Canada, in Europe, and some in, in Asia, one can, can, uh, well, in China now, in, in Korea, and there's a plan for one in India. And, and so uh, as of today, there is, there is no, no laboratory in, in the southern hemisphere. And uh, so we, that's, that's where we, we come into, into play with, with Andes. So Andes was... Uh, started in, uh, about uh, well, eight years ago when, when we learned about the, the Agua Negra tunnel. Uh, the Agua Negra is, is, is a planned tunnel to, to be built between Argentina and Chile uh, at this point. Uh, the idea is to, to collect uh, Argentina and Brazil mainly to, uh, via Chile to, to the Asian market. So it's, of course, for comm commercial reason. It would be two tunnels, uh, 14 kilometers long, and, and the deepest point, uh, uh, more or less at the, at the border between two, the two countries, would be about 1,750 meters. So, so that's really a lot. That's, that would be one of the three or four deepest laboratory if, if we could build one here. So the um, tender started a, a few years ago, and construction is supposed to, to start next year. So it, it's really happening now. Uh, I'm not going to enter into into the details, but basically just just to give more uh, weight to the to the thing. Uh, in December uh, 2016, uh, the IDB, which is the Inter-American Development Bank, which is financing the, the project, uh, gave the first 40 million dollars to to the project, and, and last year 280 extra million dollars were were approved for the project. Uh, the total cost is about 1.25 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, so already uh, about a fifth of the uh, of the total cost is available for for the construction. So it, it, it's really starting now, and it's unlikely to stop unless uh, Argentina crashes, as you may have seen in, in the newspaper in the last few days. But well, let's be let's still be optimistic about about the future. So yeah, it's it's a, a great opportunity for us. Uh, because uh, to build a, a laboratory in a tunnel, you, you have to do it when the tunnel is built. Uh, once the tunnel is built, it's, it's impossible to, 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 to get rid of all the rock needed to, to excavate the tunnel, uh, the laboratory. So it, it's now or never. And so it, it's a, a unique opportunity to, make, uh, to build a deep laboratory and to make also a, a big laboratory at the same time. So, so we want it to, to be... Um, to be important uh, for its size and for its depth, not only the fact that it is the only one in the southern hemisphere. So, of course, being in the southern hemisphere is an extra uh, added you know, interest, especially for us, for, for the locals. And uh, there are some some reason for from the physics point of view also to to want one in the southern hemisphere. You will have the opposite weather modulation I talked about for Dama Libra for dark matter signal. You even have a daily modulation also in some models of self-interacting dark matter or things like that. It's complementary for supernova neutrinos. If there is a, if a supernova explodes, you want to see neutrinos directly in the lab and also some going through the whole Earth to, to study MSW effect and, and other studies like that. If you want to study geoneutrinos, the background is coming from a nuclear power plant and most laboratories are in a well-developed well area where nuclear power is an important source of energy. In Argentina, there are a few uh, nuclear plants here, but they are quite far away. So the signal-to-noise ratio for, for geoneutrinos is, is very high for, for the Andes location. And it's also a, a geoactive region, which makes it very interesting, not for uh, our high-energy physics community, but also for the geophysics community. And we, we wanted to, to have an important uh, geoscience uh, part into the lab, which is not uh, our main topic, but uh, it's a good opportunity to, to do that. And so since the beginning, uh, we've uh, proposed Andes to be not uh, not only a, 
uh, a lab which would receive international experiments as, as any other lab, but to have uh, it really run as an international laboratory. So build something like a kind of a CERN, but uh, focused on underground science. And our example uh, we, we are taking uh, currently is called Sesame, which is the uh, synchrotron radiation uh, facility in the Middle East, where a lot of different countries, uh, which well, some of them don't even talk to one another, are, are working together to, to make it. So we are pretty sure we, we can we can do something similar in, in Latin America uh, based uh, based on this experience and, and our ideas. To, uh, so of course it will be in Latin America. So we want to have a strong component from Latin American countries, but not only Latin American countries. So we also have <coughs> Uh, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, uh, the US, UK, we, which are interested in, in working with us. And we really want this to, to be international. So the lab will be uh, Argentina and Chile because it's in the tunnel and so it has to be, be national. Uh, but uh, this is just the, the physical uh, cavities which are, which are from, from both countries. But then the, the lab in itself and the physics will, will be run by an international uh, consortium. So the, the, the scientific program that we will have at the beginning for Andes is uh, the one typically for, for any underground laboratory. So neutrino, dark matter, geophysics, uh, biology, low radiation measurement probably uh, will have a, a, a room for, for, for an accelerator to do nuclear astrophysics. So I'm not going to, to enter into, into the details, uh, uh, but well, uh, we can discuss about that in, in the question if you want. So here are some examples of things we, we are discussing about. Uh, for example, the double beta decay experiment, for example, uh, Super Nemo, or Next, uh, two different technologies. Then the large neutrino detector could be a scintillator, could be liquid argon. Uh, we will have a large pit for, for, for such a detector. Dark matter in Andes is difficult to, to plan for 10 years. Uh, dark matter is a field where things evolve a lot. Uh, but uh, we, we want to, to host a fourth generation experiment and to, to work on, on new technologies, uh, dark sides so or argon TPC is something uh, very promising for, for the future. Uh, <clears throat> due to the background rejection they can get in argon. And nuclear astrophysics um, have an accelerator underground to, to do some some measurements which are relevant for uh, for nuclear astrophysics. So there are a lot of things that uh, that that we want to do in, in Andes and which are which are in, in our scientific program. So the the first proposal we had when we, when we started was was to do something like that with a big pit, a big K, a big cavern, and a, an intermediate type cavern and a few small ones for for smaller experiments. And this is uh, our current conceptual design, which was uh, designed by Lombardi, which is a Swiss firm who, which did uh, a case for, for CERN and uh, Grand Sasso. And so, 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 so really know uh, this one of the three big companies for, for underground uh, construction, and they are experts on, on the topic. They are the one who, who made the study, who made the, all the design for the tunnel. And so this is uh the current stat the current design for for Andes with a big pit a big cave a smaller one and a, and a few offices for, for different different studies uh total cost is about 40 million dollars so it's uh, below 2.5 percent of the of the cost of the tunnel and we want to keep it of course marginal since we want to add it uh, as a, an overhead to the to the construction of, of the tunnel uh we've uh, started uh Two weeks ago, to, to, to do the last modification to, to, the, to the design and to start the detailed engineering study with the people of Lombardy. And so, in particular, we are adding a, a geoscience area, we are adding a, a bio laboratory, we reordered some of the rooms, added a, a new uh, clean room, uh, added a, an accelerator room, uh, and all this uh, trying to keep the cost uh, close to $40 million. Uh, while uh, making it more multidisciplinary, this design, as uh, the original one, was more coming from our high energy physics community. And so, in the last uh, the last few years, we've discussed a lot, especially for, with the geo people, to 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 make this lab also uh, as interesting as possible for for them. So, in addition to to this underground laboratory, we will have a support laboratories uh, outside. Uh, of the underground installation. So the one of, one of the, the thing is that the, the lab will be quite high. Uh, the tunnel is at 4,000 meters uh, of altitude. So this means there is no real uh, installation close by to, to the tunnel. So, so we need 
to have this support lab uh, quite quite far from from the tunnel. Uh, we we want to have one a, a big one in La Serena, which is also an ISO center. Where there are a lot of telescopes in, in the area, uh, so this would be a, a one which is well connected to to the outside to, to receive big experiments and things like that. And another one in Argentina, maybe closer to the uh, to the underground laboratory to have more the, the let's say the technical uh, uh, aspect and day-to-day uh, -day running of, of the experiments on the ground. Of course, uh, we have to, to integrate this to, with the local universities, have digital centers, and, and, and all this uh, very important contact with, with the local, uh, <coughs> local communities. Uh, we've got a huge uh, international and institutional support, so I'm not going to, to enter into all, all these details, but uh, this, this has allowed us to, to get all the green lights from the, from the politics point of view, uh, both in, in Argentina and in Chile. Uh, and in particular, we, uh, something which has been very important is the, the support of the Antilla Binacional Tunela Guanera, which is a binational entity in charge of the tunnel, uh, both from the political and technical aspect of the tunnel. And so they are the ones who, who decide what goes into the tunnel. And so we, we got a, a first meeting with them in 2012 and then a second one last year, uh, which were very, very important for us to, to get uh, the, the support. And, uh, and the green light of all the institutions in, in our countries. Uh, another thing uh, important was, was to, to get not only people telling us that it was a good idea to do that, but also telling us that they wanted to, to work uh, in this laboratory once, uh, once it would be there. And so there are a lot of, of groups, including in uh, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Mexico, which are the four Latin American countries which uh, have been uh, pushing for Andy since, since the beginning, and we've been discussing uh, a lot with colleagues from Colombia to, to add Colombia in, <coughs> after, after the election, and the new president, and when the uh, science structure in Colombia will, will be uh, back up. Uh, and, uh, and also contact with other countries in, in Latin America to, to add them to, to the group interested in Andes. So the, our timeline, so how things have uh, evolved in the, in the last years, so we started in 2010, we had uh, the first three workshops in, in Argentina, Brazil, and, and Chile. Uh, then in 2012, we, uh, we had the first big step, uh, since we were approved both by the Argentine Ministry for, for Science and Technology and by this uh, binational entity, the Evitan. And so since, since then, uh, basically, all, 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 the, all the political aspects were, were, were sold and we, we, we had support to do the things. Uh, we had a fourth workshop in Mexico in 2014, and at that workshop we created a, a unit into the, the CLAF. The CLAF is the uh, Latin American Center for Physics. And so this, uh, this unit gives us uh, an official international status within, within the CLAF and under the, uh, the support of UNESCO. And this was also a way for, it's a way for us to, to, to get money from Argentina, Chile to, to pay for, for studies and, and, and to work together uh, under uh, an officially uh, international um, uh, uh, entity. Uh, so we, with this uh, unit, we, we could uh, contract this uh, new conceptual design study in, in 2015. And so we got it at the beginning of 2016 with, with Lombardi. Uh, and so we presented that to, to the Evitan. Uh, and uh, and we got uh, approved in, in July 2017 as an addition to to, to the civil work on, of the tunnel. And uh, two weeks ago, we we finally got the the, the okay both from from San Juan and and Coquimbo, so the, the regions in in Argentina and Chile, uh, to start the detailed engineering study of the laboratory which is uh, already half a million dollars, so it already starts to be real money, uh, which is paid by, by these two uh, provinces, uh, province and region in, in Argentina and Chile. And uh, we, we need to, to finish uh, this detailed engineering study with Lombardi uh, by the end of July of this year uh, to add Andes into the, <coughs> all the um, uh, tender document for, for the, the company to uh, to enter into the, the tender and, and to start construction in, in 2019. So, so we are already at, at the last phase of, of the design of the laboratory and starting to, to see the thing really, really becoming live. 
so we uh, take the opportunity to to invite you to to join to our next workshop uh, so uh, the registration is open up to uh, uh, this this friday uh, so join now uh, it will be in in sao paulo in, in brazil august 4 to, to the 6 uh, it's following a, a school on um, neutrino and, and dark matter uh, two two weeks before this uh, this workshop so also if you're a student or if you have students uh, please uh, look at look at this it is at the ictp uh, center uh, in, in in brazil so have a look at it and uh, inscribe yourself or inscribe your students so we, so we can discuss about uh, about the future uh, at this event so to to conclude uh, so this is a, the web page of, of Andes. You, you, you can get more information there. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that this is really a, a unique opportunity that we have to, to, to build this uh, uh, really world-class deep underground laboratory, uh, one of a kind in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, operated by an international consortium. Uh, there, there, there are some plans to have an underground laboratory in, in Australia, which looked very promising uh, a few years ago, but the mine just uh, closed uh, two years ago, and so I, I'm not sure if if it will happen or not. So it's either one of a kind uh, laboratory, or maybe the only uh, laboratory in the southern hemisphere. And in any case, um, it would be deeper and bigger than what is planned in, in Australia. So the, and this will really be a, a world class uh, map uh, laboratory on the map, and it's uh, it's a great opportunity for us in, in Latin America to to be part of it. So that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Javier. Uh, very nice talk. Um, so now I'm going to to open the, the the floor for questions from the audience here, and then maybe a couple of questions from the the actual streaming. So, does anybody would like to have a, a go at a first question? Anybody? I have a question. Oh, Nicolas. Go ahead, Nicolas. So, thank you, Javier, for the nice talk. So I wanted to ask you what happened to this laboratory in, in Australia? I don't know. Uh, the only thing I know is from from newspaper that I'm following. So basically, uh, the, so it was supposed to, uh, it's SUPL, uh, S-U-P-L. It was supposed to, to be built in, a, in an active mine. Uh, and uh, the mine closed because, well, it was not, uh, uh, not producing uh, money enough. <clears throat> And so when the when the mine closes and it starts to be very expensive to to have a lab, because uh, the the access uh, to to the mine uh, to the underground is actually very expensive to to run. So in Snow Lab, for example, uh, I think the the access itself costs something like forty million dollars per year. So of course uh, in Snow Lab it's an active mine, so they don't pay for it. The, the company pays for it. Uh, so that's why it works. But if the mine is not working, it's it's very difficult to. To be operating, so uh, I, I, I tried to enter the, the web page of the of the laboratory uh, two days ago, and it was down. Uh, the last news uh, in, in Google News are from uh, last year, and they are not very very positive. So it, it, it's a it's a tough topic. Uh, actually, here in Argentina, we uh, there has been an underground laboratory in, in the nineties. In a, in a mine in uh, not not very far from Bagloche, 800 kilometers from here, uh, in Sierra Grande, uh, where uh, Frank Avignone and, and, and colleagues made uh, some uh, a dark matter experiment in, in 1993-95 to try to see some daily modulation of the signal, and uh, and then it closed because uh, the mine closed. Uh, we are now actually trying to to get it uh, as a, to get it up. Uh, up again to to have something to to play with before we we get Andes, and, and actually it's not easy because uh, the, the the price for for iron uh, went uh, too low and so, so it's not it's not worth for for the company to to keep to keep it operating, and so it's not maintained. It's just kept at a very low level and uh, it's very difficult to to access it. So this is um, I, I think it's kind of the of the issue that they they've had in. Uh, in in Australia. Yeah, thank you. So th this th this will be really the the first laboratory multi-purpose laboratory in the south, right? So it, it was it well it would start operating sort of what 2017 or so 20 no no 2029 or so. 
Yeah, yeah. When the when the tunnel opens, you know, which um, officially should be twenty twenty seven, then uh, I mean, I, I, of course, like uh, all of us, uh, I've given this talk uh, uh, tens of times, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I've. I go modifying the slides uh, from one talk to another. And so if I look at my first slides uh, in, in 2011, uh, I think it was supposed to be open in 2019, so next year. And now I, it's, I, it's, it, yeah. it moves by one year every year. But now uh, basically the issue was that there was no financing for the tunnel. And uh, now there is financing from the IDB. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's pretty pretty sure that in 2027, let's say with the delays from construction 2029, uh, it will it will open. And are they, uh, at least for neutrino physics or dark matter searches, uh, have, has anybody started with, with this detector in mind, uh, do any preliminary work on sensitivity analysis or what you would expect uh, to observe? Uh, in particular, I guess the, the modulation that I guess DAMA observes and they could be observed in this detector in principle, right? Yeah, so there are a few a few studies uh, of these things. Uh, so there is one paper which is actually in one of the... So this is a modulation from, from the Libra, for example, uh, and you may want to make a similar experiment. Uh, so here, for example, there is this, this, uh, this study in archive uh, from quite a few years ago, uh, on what you could do with a supernova neutrino uh, detector in uh, in Andes, and how it is complementary from from observation uh, from the current uh, laboratories in Europe, in in, in Japan, in Kamiokande, and the Ice Cube, which is also a good detector for for this mm -hmm. kind of neutrinos. Uh, from uh, for dark matter, it, it's it's a bit. Uh, more difficult because uh, 10 years is a big time scale, right? And neutrino physics, we more or less understand what we want to do, but uh, dark matter is a field which is changing very, very fast. So, so we have idea of what to do now. Uh, but for example, modulation from DAMA, uh, even if we mention that as a as a same point, uh, I would expect this topic to be to be closed uh, by this time. There is, a, for example, a, a cosine experiment in in Korea, which is running right now. So it's, they have kind of the same modulation, but not exactly the same. And uh, so uh, with their measurements, they should already be able to, to discard uh, DAMA if it's, uh, if it's not a, a genuine dark matter effect as most of the community is, is believing. Now, if they have the same signal as DAMA, then uh, actually, then we might actually need to, to do something in Andes. Yeah. I have one more question. Yeah, and another Sorry. important topic is to say that we, we, I mean, so for us, of course, it's interesting to, 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 to go into, into the field, but it's also important, I think, for, for the underground physics uh, community to, to get a big space uh, available in the South and, and to get uh, manpower, right? So our community in, in Latin America, so we've been doing, uh, let's say, theoretical physics for, for many years because there was no money uh, in the last, uh, 10, 20 years, uh, we, we've been starting to do quite a, quite a lot of uh, real experimental high energy physics. So in, in Argentina, there is OG, uh, with of course colleagues from, from Brazil and Mexico and now Colombia. Uh, but there is also, uh, well, a lot of people who have been working in Fermilab and now mm -hmm. working in CERN. And so we already have uh, a critical mass in uh, HEP uh, experimental physics. Uh, which which could uh, bring a lot to the underground physics community. So so we can also come maybe not with a lot of money, uh, as long as our country still uh, has this uh, uh, regular crisis. But at least with a well formed um, uh, high energy physics community to, to contribute to. So I think that's also an important aspect uh, from the political point of view. Do you envision uh, the South Americans to do their own research and development when it comes to design? And because I mean, you, I like that it is a political talk a little bit because I think an undergraduate, an underground laboratory in South America will just create more, I guess, the capacity we need in order to start leading in research and development. But um, we still probably wouldn't wouldn't want all the technology to keep coming from other places instead think about making our own technologies, right? 
Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> uh, I, I can talk, for example, about OJ, so in uh, Piaggio Observatory in Argentina, so the, the largest cosmic ray observatory uh, on Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we, we've been running for about 10 years, and in 2015, we've been developing an upgrade on the OJ Observatory. And so five projects were competing, and the project which won was a project we proposed here by Loge. So, mm -hmm. so we have the capacity to design uh, uh, experiments at the level which is competing uh, with Europe. Now, the thing is, the project in itself, uh, building these 1,600 detectors, uh, $15 million, is something mm -hmm. which the whole collaboration is going to do. And actually, most of it will be done in Europe. Uh, because also that's where they, they have the capability to, to build these things. And so if we have the laboratory here, uh, we will have to develop this, this capacity. And, um, last month we had a meeting in Argentina. I, I don't know if I, yeah, I put the picture, so this, this is me. Uh, so we, we, we had this workshop, which was Fundamental Meets Technology, where we discussed how uh, can we, from fundamental physics, uh, yeah. make experiments which are uh, 10 of million euros time scale or uh, cost scale or 100 million euros where we don't do the experiment in our lab but we need as uh, a private sector to, to, to do the technology part at least part of it and, and so we, we have more integration between the, uh, let's say the public sector and the private sector and so at this table there, there was, so this is uh, Lino Barania, the Minister for Science this is Oscar Gasseta, who's the head of the Atomic Commission of Energy. This is the head of uh, INVAP, which is a company which makes satellites and nuclear reactors. This is the head of the technology sector of the uh, petroleum company in Argentina. And this is a sub-head of the uh, science agency, uh, space agency in Argentina. So yeah. it, it's these kind of things which won't happen if we don't have these kind of labs in, in, our, in our region. So I think this is also very, very important in the link between our, let's say, high energy physics and fundamental uh, area and, and, and the society, let's say, uh, technology. If you look uh, at CERN or Snow Lab, for every dollar or euro which is invested, there is something like three dollar or euro uh, of, of economic impact. There is all this uh, high technology society which are developed around these labs. So this is something we also want to do. So this is not the reason why we built this lab. We want to do basic physics. But this is also something which will help, I think, in other countries. And we want to, to develop. Uh, of course, Argentina and Chile are, are the ones with the most benefit of it. Uh, but this is also something we, we, we have to, to spread through the, through the continent, so the whole Latin American continent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody would like to ask another question? Yeah, I have a question uh, for Javier. Javier, uh, yeah, very nice. The talk is very enlightening to know how this laboratory could bring a lot of benefit for the for the Latin American community in research. But the, the same stuff that you were talking before, how to spread the, the, the collaboration for other other countries, how is more or less the procedure if, if some institution want to to join the, the consortium or want to participate is it kind of an organization by country when which in each country there is like kind of a structure or directly institution can contact and the andes committee to to see if there is a possible way to participate in the in the project yeah so so right now we are not uh let's say we are not very well organized uh, let's say the things as they are uh, <coughs> so yeah so we've been looking a lot at, at Sesame uh, as an example of how, how they are organized, how, how the structure is organized. And, and we want to build something similar, but we've not built anything yet. The, the reason for that mostly was that uh, up to, uh, let's say, a few months ago, uh, we had on the green, all the green light, but uh, not, not anything uh, real being done by any of the interested country. So even in Argentina, we have the green light from the Minister of Science, who's the same minister since we started the project. Uh, so, so everything was supposed to be perfect, but we did, didn't get a, a single uh, peso from, uh, from, from the ministry from, to do anything. 
So uh, in this status, uh, we, we, we were still at the level where uh, different physicists and different institutions were, were talking among themselves, but we didn't have anything uh, at the level or at an official level. So uh, it changed in the last few months. So in Argentina, we have uh, our uh, now uh, an official agreement signed between the Minister for Science, the head of the Atomic Energy Commission, the head of the CONICET, um, National uh, Institute for Science, let's say, and the governor of the San Juan province. In Chile, they have an, uh, an official task force led by CONICET uh, with a representative of various ministries and, and the region. Uh, so, so, so we already have official uh, groups. And then we had this uh, CLAF uh, ANDES unit, and it's mm, still not clear how, how we uh, organize all the different uh, groups. But since these are more or less the same people, and we, we manage the, the thing. But uh, I would say with the next two years, uh, we will have to work on, on building this, uh, this uh, CESAMI like structure so, so that we can have an official way to, to get into, into ANDES. So as of today, uh, if you are interested, uh, if your institution is interested, or if your country is interested, uh, the, the best way is to contact us. So you, you can write at uh, info at uh, andeslab.org or just send me a mail. Uh, and, uh, and we discuss on how to do that. For example, we've been, so we have an official representative in Argentina, in Chile, in Brazil, and in Mexico. And uh, for example, we, we are discussing with Colombia, the integration of Colombia. So for, here it's uh, Marta Losada. Uh, with whom I, I, I've been discussing. And so she, uh, currently our status is to wait the election and, and everything to, to settle in Colombia so that we, we can start to see uh, uh, at which level we, we make an agreement with, with Colombia to, to get officially Colombia in, in, in the group. Then we have an uh, agreement signed between Argentina and Germany, uh, France and Italy. Uh, so Germany, it's Helmholtz, uh, France, it's CNRS, and Italy, it's INFM, uh, which include Andes uh, as topic for, for research. So, so we, we are working with uh, DOE and, and Fermilab. So uh, as of today, it's not really organized. So I, I, I would suggest if, you're, if you and your group or your institution is interested to, to contact me and, and we discuss on, on how, to, how to plan that and, and basically to, to discuss on how you, you expect in the future, your country to, to be part of it. So our idea is to do something like CERN, so to have maybe two representatives per country, uh, one uh, which is from the science uh, part and one which is from the agency, so the financing part. And this is what, uh, what they've done in Sesame, and it seems to work. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's more or less how we see the things for, for the next uh, few years. No, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's nice to know how it's, it's going to be more. The planning of the structure of the the organizational aspect of the of the land and this. So another question was regarding how is the also the maybe the synergy with the other experiments that are in the in the region like Pierre Auger, even though they are not exactly in the same topic, but the community could be kind of uh, transfer some technology knowledge and stuff like this. Also in the in the side of Chile, they are gonna they are all the part of the observatories that also could benefit for knowing some aspect about neutrino, multi, multi messenger or something like that. Do you know if yeah. there is also planning to use Andes like a hub for, for all the this research to, to, to meet in a point, something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, is, uh, this has been, so uh, Andes, we, we, we started uh, a, a bottom up approach. So we, we started contacting a lot of colleagues, uh, visiting a lot of laboratories and, and from all the feedback we, we, we had, we, we ended up with, with this proposal. I mean, one of my, my first talk, uh, there was a few options for Andes, and one of them was just uh, discussing uh, with the company of having one of the small uh, security tunnel, uh, let's say uh, 20 square meters uh, closed and available to do one small experiment with colleagues of mine. I mean, it, it was not clear how, how the community would be receptive to the idea. So, so we really started bottom up and, and we got a lot of, of positive feedback and a lot of, of colleagues interested in it. So that's why we ended up with such a, a big lab because $40 million uh, for us, it, it, it's a big amount of money. So for example, OG in, in Argentina, 
uh, Ogier will finish in 2025. Uh, so Andes is the natural uh, uh, project uh, after Andes, after Ogier. And uh, so I, I'm from Ogier, I've been working for 20 years in Ogier. And our group is looking into Andes, and uh, people in Buenos Aires are looking into Andes. So it's, it's a natural continuation, let's say, of Ogier. And colleagues working in LHC, uh, we are also talking with them, saying, well, OK, so of course you are now fully de dedicated to LHC and Atlas, and Run2 is, is starting. And so, so, so this is your, uh, your main topic. But maybe you could start uh, having one student working in, in underground physics, or starting to have 10%, 20% of your time looking at it. And in five years, uh, having 30% of your time. And in 10 years, having half of your lab working in, in underground physics and in, and in Andes. And in Chile, it's the same thing. So they, they, they have started uh, um, uh, high energy physics experimental uh, work on, only 10 years ago uh, in, in Valparaiso. And now they, they are building uh, as a part of the, of the small wheel upgrade of, of the Atlas detector. And so, so they are really putting Andes on, on their map for, for the development within the next 10 years. And uh, from the uh, telescope uh, community, uh, we are working on this synergy. Actually, uh, people from, from the telescope community are helping us a lot on, on the structure. And the other one who suggested us to, to look at the uh, structure. And uh, there is also some, some interest from the Chilean government, because up to now, the telescopes and the ESO uh, has been something like, well, come, put your telescopes and, and do basically what you want. So they are, they are eager to have a more active participation in, in, in the project. So uh, there has been a, also a workshop a few years ago about uh, synergy between high energy physics and astronomy. Uh, astronomy used to be uh, well, one scientist uh, doing one observation and working in his lab with uh, this data. Now it has moved, LSST, so these are terabytes of data. And so they kind of need uh, our uh, approach of uh, running uh, scripts and batches on tons of data and just looking at histograms and things we've been doing in, in particle physics for, for tens of years. So, so there is also a natural synergy between uh, high energy physics and astronomy. Uh, so so all, all, all this is, is really moving, moving well together. And, and, and I think for, for Latin America, it, it, all the experience we've, we've built with OG, with uh, collaboration with uh, Fermilab at D0, uh, and Tevatron uh, time and, and now uh, with LHC it, it, it is a very good base to, to, to have this uh, critical mass for, for Andes. Yeah, it's a very nice uh, opportunity for the, for the region, in fact. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I have a, a quick question. Um, what, what about the people uh, working on site? I mean, where, where are they going to live? Yeah, so we we have uh, so we plan to have the, the Argentine lab. So it's, it, we don't have exactly well defined where the two support lab will be. That's something we we have to discuss also for political reason with the, with the local uh, government to see what what is best for for all of us. Uh, if you put it very close to the lab, then you, you are quite far from the university, so it, it will be very uh, only operational. Uh, so, but one thing we we are going to have is, is uh, the uh, so the, the tunnel itself and, and, and a portion of both countries uh, will be uh, be national and uh, custom. Uh, so we still have custom in, in Latin America. It's not like Europe. And, and so when you go from Argentina to Chile or Chile to Argentina, you have to go through through custom. It's uh, sometimes a quite an hour or a few hours to, to cross the, the border. And so the, the, the custom is not at 4,000 meters of altitude. So it's quite, it's much lower, 2,000 something. And so uh, at, uh, at the portals, th there will be uh, offices. Uh, and we've, uh, we are discussing with, with the Ebitan uh, to have uh, quite a, a few offices at, at both, both sides, where uh, the people who are actually working uh, every day uh, underground uh, could stay and uh, have just a, a few tens of kilometers of driving to do every day and not uh, hundreds of, of kilometers is it would be in the, in the support laboratories. So our idea is to have the support laboratories more connected, let's say, to the, to the universities uh, where you do, uh, where you have uh, 
research groups working um, day to day, but not going to the to the underground laboratory every day. And then when, when you go to the underground laboratory and you have to work, let's say, for a week in the installation of a detector or, or calibration or, or do radio work every day, then you would stay in, um, in some offices which are close by to the, to the laboratory. I see, I see. So the control rooms would be at the support labs. Yeah, the idea is, uh, I mean, it, it's already happening in, in most uh, in most experiments. You, uh, you you always want. I mean, even if you if you go to Snow Lab, uh, Snow Lab is a, is a fantastic laboratory, uh, but to go underground is not trivial, and uh, you have to be there uh, when the cage is going down because it's uh, run by the mine. And uh, if you go after half an hour, you finish your work. Well, you have to wait four hours until there is a cable going up. So, so it, it, it's not as e as easy as you as you want. So everybody uh, is trying to 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 have the the, the experiments run uh, alone as much as possible and uh, to be uh, uh, controlled by um, with remote control room as much as possible. Even in OG, we we are. We are operating our telescopes with remote shift as much as possible because it's well, it's expensive to send some people to to Argentina to the site, and so so this this is something that uh, I guess most experiments will, will try to run uh, as independent uh, and as remote uh, as possible. But of course, then you, you need to fix things when they break. You need to install the detector. You have to calibrate it from time to time. You have to refill the uh, cryogenic. Uh, liquid or whatever you you have to, to put a, a radioactive source for some specific calibration so of course you have to to, to go there from time to time uh, so for this specific operation we will have uh, sites which are very close to, to the lab uh, and then most of it we will try to, to do uh, as remotely as possible and in 10 years probably things will be even more remote than what we are we are doing right now right yeah well thank i think you. Uh, thank you I think we are we are uh, on the hour, and uh, I want to thank uh, Xavier for his for his time and uh, for the talk. And we really look forward for to this ex you know this experiment to take off in the very near future for you know for for us to keep growing as a as a as a, as a, as a continent and as a, as a scientific enterprise. So thank you, Xavier, and uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the broadcast now. And if you like, you can stay and we can chat us, us some more. But uh, no no pressure. Well, thank you, folks, for okay. joining us today. Um, uh, uh, keep an eye out for the next uh, webinar, which is coming soon, and uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you. Goodbye.